Oak Mint is not known, but there can be no doubt that it was a cave of the Ice Age containing animal pictures. All this goes to prove that the caves and rocks with the animal paintings have always been instinctively felt to be what they originally were, religious places. The Newman of the place has outlived the centuries. In a number of caves, the modern visitor must travel through low, dark, and damp passages till he reaches the point where the great painted chambers suddenly open out. This arduous approach may express the desire of the primitive men to safeguard from common sight all that was contained and went on in the caves, and to protect their mystery. The sudden and unexpected sight of the paintings in the chambers, coming after the difficult and awe-inspiring approach, must have made an overwhelming impression on primitive man. The Paleolithic cave paintings consist almost entirely of figures of animals whose movements and postures have been observed in nature and are rendered with great artistic skill. There are, however, many details that show that the figures were intended to be something more than naturalistic reproductions. Kuhn writes, The strange thing is that a good many primitive paintings have been used as targets. At Montespan, there is an engraving of a horse that is being driven into a trap. It is pitted with the marks of missiles. A clay model of a bear in the same cave has 42 holes. These pictures suggest a hunting magic like that still practiced today by hunting tribes in Africa. The painted animal has the function of a double. By its symbolic slaughter, the hunters attempt to anticipate and ensure the death of the real animal. This is a form of sympathetic magic, which is based on the reality of a double represented in a picture. What happens to the picture will happen to the original. The underlying psychological fact is a strong identification between a living being and its image, which is considered to be the being's soul. This is one reason why a great many primitive people today will shrink from being photographed. Other cave pictures must have served magic fertility rites. They show animals at the moment of mating. An example can be seen in the figures of a male and female bison in the Tuc de Dubert cave in France. Thus, the realistic picture of the animals was enriched by overtones of magic and took on a symbolic significance. It became the image of the living essence of the animal. The most interesting figures in the cave paintings are those of semi-human beings in animal disguise, which are sometimes to be found besides the animals. In the Trois Frères cave in France, a man wrapped in an animal hide is playing a primitive flute as if he meant to put a spell on the animals. In the same cave, there is a dancing human being with antlers, a horse's head, and bear's paws. This figure, dominating a medley of several hundred animals, is unquestionably the lord of the animals. The customs and usages of some primitive African tribes today can throw some light on the meaning of these mysterious and doubtless symbolic figures. In initiations, secret societies, and even the institution of monarchy in these tribes, animals and animal disguises often play an important part. The king and chief are animals too, generally lions or leopards. Vestiges of this custom may be discerned in the title of the last emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, Lion of Judah, or the honorific name of Dr. Hastings Banda, the Lion of Malawi. The further back we go in time, or the more primitive and close to nature the society is, the more literally such titles must be taken. A primitive chief is not only disguised as the animal. When he appears at initiation rites in full animal disguise, he is the animal. Still more, he is an animal spirit, a terrifying demon who performs circumcision. At such moments, he incorporates or represents the ancestor of the tribe and the clan, and therefore the primal god himself. He represents and is the totem animal. Thus, we probably should not go far wrong in seeing in the figure of the dancing animal man in the Trois Frères cave a kind of chief who has been transformed by his disguise into an animal demon. In the course of time, the complete animal disguise was superseded in many places by animal and demon masks. Primitive men lavished all their artistic skill on these masks, and many of them are still unsurpassed in the power and intensity of their expression. They are often the objects of the same veneration as the god or demon himself. Animal masks play a part in the folk arts of many modern countries, like Switzerland, or in the magnificently expressive masks of the ancient Japanese no-drama, which is still performed in modern Japan. 
The symbolic function of the mask is the same as that of the original animal disguise. Individual human expression is submerged, but in its place the wearer assumes the dignity and the beauty, and also the horrifying expression, of an animal demon. In psychological terms, the mask transforms its wearer into an archetypal image. Dancing, which was originally nothing more than a completion of the animal disguise by appropriate movements and gestures, was probably supplementary to the initiation or other rites. It was, so to speak, performed by demons in honor of a demon. In the soft clay of the Tuc de Dubert cave, Herbert Kuhn found footprints that led around animal figures. They show that dancing was part of even the Ice Age rites. Only heel prints can be seen, Kuhn writes. The dancers had moved like bisons. They had danced a bison dance for the fertility and increase of the animals and for their slaughter. In his introductory chapter, Dr. Jung has pointed out the close relation or even identification between the native and his totem animal or bush soul. There are special ceremonies for the establishment of this relationship, especially the initiation rites for boys, The boy enters into possession of his animal soul and at the same time sacrifices his own animal being by circumcision. This dual process admits him to the totem clan and establishes his relationship to his totem animal. Above all, he becomes a man and, in a still wider sense, a human being. East Coast Africans described the uncircumcised as animals. They had neither received an animal soul nor sacrificed their animality. In other words, since neither the human nor the animal aspect of an uncircumcised boy's soul had become conscious, his animal aspect was regarded as dominant. The animal motif is usually symbolic of man's primitive and instinctual nature. Even civilized men must realize the violence of their instinctual drives and their powerlessness in face of the autonomous emotions erupting from the unconscious. This is still more the case with primitive men whose consciousness is not highly developed and who are still less well equipped to weather the emotional storm. In the first chapter of this book, when Dr. Jung is discussing the ways in which man developed the power of reflection, he takes an example of an African who fell into a rage and killed his beloved little son. When the man recovered himself, he was overwhelmed with grief and remorse for what he had done. In this case, a negative impulse broke loose and did its deadly work regardless of the conscious will. The animal demon is a highly expressive symbol for such an impulse. The vividness and concreteness of the image enables man to establish a relationship with it as a representative of the overwhelming power in himself. He fears it and seeks to propitiate it by sacrifice and ritual. A large number of myths are concerned with a primal animal which must be sacrificed in the cause of fertility or even creation. One example of this is the sacrifice of a bull by the Persian sun god Mithras from which sprang the earth with all wealth and fruitfulness. In the Christian legend of St. George slaying the dragon, the primeval rite of sacrificial slaughter again appears. In the religions and religious art of practically every race, Animal attributes are ascribed to the supreme gods, or the gods are represented as animals. The ancient Babylonians translated their gods into the heavens in the shape of the ram, the bull, the crab, the lion, the scorpion, the fish, and so on, the signs of the zodiac. The Egyptians represented the goddess Hathor as cow-headed, the god Amun as ram-headed, and Thoth as ibis-headed, or in the shape of a baboon. Ganesha, the Hindu god of good fortune, has a human body but the head of an elephant. Vishnu is a boar. Hanuman is an ape god, etc. The Hindus, incidentally, do not assign the first place in the hierarchy of being to man. The elephant and lion stand higher. Greek mythology is full of animal symbolism. Zeus, the father of the gods, often approaches a girl whom he desires in the shape of a swan, a bull, or an eagle. In Germanic mythology, the cat is sacred to the goddess Freya, while the boar, the raven, and the horse are sacred to Wotan. Even in Christianity, animal symbolism plays a surprisingly great part. Three of the evangelists have animal emblems. St. Luke has the ox, St. Mark the lion, and St. John the eagle. Only one, St. Matthew, is represented as a man or as an angel. 
Christ himself symbolically appears as the Lamb of God or the fish, but he is also the serpent exalted on the cross, the lion, and in rarer cases, the unicorn. These animal attributes of Christ indicate that even the Son of God, the supreme personification of man, can no more dispense with his animal nature than with his higher spiritual nature. The subhuman as well as the superhuman is felt to belong to the realm of the divine. The relationship of these two aspects of man is beautifully symbolized in the Christmas picture of the birth of Christ in a stable among animals. The boundless profusion of animal symbolism in the religion and art of all times does not merely emphasize the importance of the symbol. It shows how vital it is for men to integrate into their lives the symbol's psychic content, instinct. In itself, an animal is neither good nor evil. It is a piece of nature. It cannot desire anything that is not in its nature. To put this another way, it obeys its instincts. These instincts often seem mysterious to us, but they have their parallel in human life. The foundation of human nature is instinct. But in man, the animal being, which lives in him as his instinctual psyche, may become dangerous if it is not recognized and integrated in life. Man is the only creature with the power to control instinct by his own will, but he is also able to suppress, distort, and wound it. And an animal, to speak metaphorically, is never so wild and dangerous as when it is wounded. Suppressed instincts can gain control of a man. They can even destroy him. The familiar dream in which the dreamer is pursued by an animal nearly always indicates that an instinct has been split off from consciousness and ought to be or is trying to be readmitted and integrated into life. The more dangerous the behavior of the animal in the dream, the more unconscious is the primitive and instinctual soul of the dreamer, and the more imperative is its integration into his life if some irreparable evil is to be forestalled. Suppressed and wounded instincts are the dangers threatening civilized man. Uninhibited drives are the dangers threatening primitive man. In both cases, the animal is alienated from its true nature, and for both, the acceptance of the animal soul is the condition for wholeness and a fully lived life. Primitive man must tame the animal in himself and make it his helpful companion. Civilized man must heal the animal in himself and make it his friend. Other contributors to this book have discussed the importance of the stone and animal motifs in terms of dream and myth. I have used them here only as general examples of the appearance of such living symbols throughout the history of art, and especially religious art. Let us now examine in the same way a most powerful and universal symbol, the circle. The symbol of the circle. Dr. M. L. von Franz has explained the circle or sphere as a symbol of the self. It expresses the totality of the psyche in all its aspects, including the relationship between man and the whole of nature. Whether the symbol of the circle appears in primitive sun worship or modern religion, in myths or dreams, in the mandalas drawn by Tibetan monks, in the ground plans of cities, or in the spherical concepts of early astronomers, it always points to the single most vital aspect of life, its ultimate wholeness. End of Side 7 To continue, turn the cassette over. Side 8 Man and His Symbols by Carl G. Jung Continuing with Symbolism in the Visual Arts On page 240 An Indian creation myth relates that the god Brahma, standing on a huge thousand-petaled lotus, turned his eyes to the four points of the compass. This fourfold survey from the circle of the lotus was a kind of preliminary orientation, an indispensable taking of bearings before he began his work of creation. A similar story is told of Buddha. At the moment of his birth, a lotus flower rose from the earth, and he stepped into it to gaze into the ten directions of space. The lotus in this case was eight-rayed, 
and Buddha also gazed upward and downward, making ten directions. This symbolic gesture of survey was the most concise method of showing that from the moment of his birth, the Buddha was a unique personality, predestined to receive illumination. His personality and his further existence were given the imprint of wholeness. The spatial orientation performed by Brahma and Buddha may be regarded as symbolic of the human need for psychic orientation. The four functions of consciousness described by Dr. Jung in Part 1, thought, feeling, intuition, and sensation, equip man to deal with the impressions of the world he receives from within and without. It is by means of these functions that he comprehends and assimilates his experience. It is by means of them that he can respond. Brahma's fourfold survey of the universe symbolizes the necessary integration of these four functions that man must achieve. In art, the circle is often eight-rayed. This expresses a reciprocal overlapping of the four functions of consciousness, so that four further intermediate functions come about, for instance, thought colored by feeling or intuition, or feeling tending toward sensation. In the visual art of India and the Far East, the four- or eight-rayed circle is the usual pattern of the religious images that serve as instruments of meditation. In Tibetan Lamaism especially, richly figured mandalas play an important part. As a rule, these mandalas represent the cosmos and its relation to divine powers, but a great many of the Eastern meditation figures are purely geometrical in design. These are called yantras. Aside from the circle, a very common yantra motif is formed by two interpenetrating triangles, one point upward, the other point downward. Traditionally, this shape symbolizes the union of Shiva and Shakti, the male and female divinities, a subject that also appears in sculpture in countless variations. In terms of psychological symbolism, it expresses the union of opposites, the union of the personal temporal world of the ego with the non-personal, timeless world of the non-ego. Ultimately, this union is the fulfillment and goal of all religions. It is the union of the soul with God. The two interpenetrating triangles have a symbolic meaning similar to that of the more common circular mandala. They represent the wholeness of the psyche or self, of which consciousness is just as much a part as the unconscious. In both the triangle yantras and the sculptural representations of the union of Shiva and Shakti, the emphasis lies on a tension between the opposites, hence the marked erotic and emotional character of many of them. This dynamic quality implies a process, the creation or coming into being of wholeness, while the four- or eight-rayed circle represents wholeness as such, as an existing entity. The abstract circle also figures in Zen painting. Speaking of a picture entitled The Circle by the famous Zen priest Sangai, another Zen master writes, In the Zen sect, the circle represents enlightenment. It symbolizes human perfection. Abstract mandalas also appear in European Christian art. Some of the most splendid examples are the rose windows of the cathedrals. These are representations of the self of man transposed onto the cosmic plane. A cosmic mandala in the shape of a shining white rose was revealed to Dante in a vision. We may regard as mandalas the halos of Christ and the Christian saints in religious paintings. In many cases, the halo of Christ is alone divided into four, a significant allusion to his sufferings as the Son of Man and his death on the cross, and at the same time a symbol of his differentiated wholeness. On the walls of early Romanesque churches, Abstract circular figures can sometimes be seen. They may go back to pagan originals. In non-Christian art, such circles are called sun wheels. They appear in rock engravings that date back to the Neolithic epoch, before the wheel was invented. As Jung has pointed out, the term sun wheel denotes only the external aspect of the figure. What really mattered at all times was the experience of an archetypal inner image, which Stone Age man rendered in his art as faithfully as he depicted bulls, gazelles, or wild horses. Many pictorial mandalas are to be found in Christian art. For example, the rather rare picture of the Virgin in the center of a circular tree, which is the god symbol of the burning bush. 
The most widely current mandalas in Christian art are those of Christ surrounded by the four evangelists. These go back to the ancient Egyptian representations of the god Horus and his four sons. Note, the picture of the Virgin in the center of a circular tree is the central panel of the Triptyque de Buisson Ardent, 1476, Cathédrale sans saveur, Aix-en-Provence. End of note. In architecture, the mandala also plays an important part, but one that often passes unnoticed. It forms the ground plan of both secular and sacred buildings in nearly all civilizations. It enters into classical, medieval, and even modern town planning. A classical example appears in Plutarch's account of the foundation of Rome. According to Plutarch, Romulus sent for builders from Etruria, who instructed him by sacred usages and written rules about all the ceremonies to be observed, in the same way as in the mysteries. First they dug a round pit, where the Comitium, or Court of Assembly, now stands, and into this pit they threw symbolic offerings of the fruits of the earth. Then each man took a small piece of earth of the land from which he came, and these were all thrown into the pit together. The pit was given the name of Mundus, which also meant the cosmos. Around it, Romulus drew the boundary of the city in a circle with a plow drawn by a bull and a cow. Wherever a gate was planned, the plowshare was taken out and the plow carried over. Note. Examples of sacred buildings with mandala ground plans, Borobudur, Java, the Taj Mahal, the Omar Mosque in Jerusalem. Secular buildings, Castel del Monte, built by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, 1194 to 1250, in Apulia. End of note. The city founded in this solemn ceremony was circular in shape. Yet the old and famous description of Rome is Urps Quadrata, the square city. According to one theory that attempts to reconcile this contradiction, the word quadrata must be understood to mean quadripartite, that is, the circular city was divided into four parts by two main arteries running from north to south and west to east. The point of intersection coincided with the mundus mentioned by Plutarch. According to another theory, the contradiction can be understood only as a symbol, namely as a visual representation of the mathematically insoluble problem of the squaring of the circle, which had greatly preoccupied the Greeks and was to play so great a part in alchemy. Strangely enough, before describing the circle ceremony of the foundation of the city by Romulus, Plutarch also speaks of Rome as Roma Quadrata, a square city. For him, Rome was both a circle and a square. In each theory, a true mandala is involved and that links up with Plutarch's statement that the foundation of the city was taught by the Etruscans as in the mysteries, as a secret rite. It was more than a mere outward form. By its mandala ground plan, the city, with its inhabitants, is exalted above the purely secular realm. This is further emphasized by the fact that the city has a center, the mundus, which established the city's relationship to the other realm, the abode of the ancestral spirits. The mundus was covered by a great stone called the soul stone. On certain days the stone was removed, and then it was said the spirits of the dead rose from the shaft. A number of medieval cities were founded on the ground plan of a mandala and were surrounded by an approximately circular wall. In such a city, as in Rome, two main arteries divided it into quarters and led to the four gates. The church, or cathedral, stood at the point of intersection of these arteries. The inspiration of the medieval city, with its quarters, was the heavenly Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, which had a square ground plan and walls with three times four gates. But Jerusalem had no temple at its center, for God's immediate presence was the center of it. The mandala ground plan for a city is by no means outmoded. A modern example is the city of Washington, D.C. Whether in classical or in primitive foundations, the Mandala ground plan was never dictated by considerations of aesthetics or economics. It was a transformation of the city into an ordered cosmos, a sacred place bound by its center to the other world, and this transformation accorded with the vital feelings and needs of religious man. Every building, sacred or secular, that has a Mandala ground plan 
is the projection of an archetypal image from within the human unconscious onto the outer world. The city, the fortress, and the temple become symbols of psychic wholeness and in this way exercise a specific influence on the human being who enters or lives in the place. It need hardly be emphasized that even in architecture the projection of the psychic content was a purely unconscious process. Such things cannot be thought up, Dr. Jung has written, but must grow again from the forgotten depths if they are to express the deepest insights of consciousness and the loftiest intuitions of the spirit, thus amalgamating the uniqueness of present-day consciousness with the age-old past of humanity. The central symbol of Christian art is not the mandala, but the cross or crucifix. Up to Carolingian times, the equilateral or Greek cross was the usual form, and therefore the mandala was indirectly implied. But in the course of time, the center moved upward until the cross took on the Latin form, with the stake and the crossbeam that is customary today. This development is important because it corresponds to the inward development of Christianity up to the High Middle Ages. In simple terms, it symbolized the tendency to remove the center of man and his faith from the earth and to elevate it into the spiritual sphere. This tendency sprang from the desire to put into action Christ saying, My kingdom is not of this world. Earthly life, the world, and the body were therefore forces that had to be overcome. Medieval man's hopes were thus directed to the beyond, for it was only from paradise that the promise of fulfillment beckoned. This endeavor reached its climax in the Middle Ages and in medieval mysticism. The hopes of the beyond found expression not only in the raising of the center of the cross, it can also be seen in the increasing height of the Gothic cathedrals, which seem to set the laws of gravity at defiance. Their cruciform ground plan is that of the elongated Latin cross, though the baptistries, with the font in the center, have a true mandala ground plan. With the dawning of the Renaissance, a revolutionary change began to occur in man's conception of the world. The upward movement, which reached its climax in the late Middle Ages, went into reverse. Man turned back to the earth. He rediscovered the beauties of nature and the body, made the first circumnavigation of the globe, and proved the world to be a sphere. The laws of mechanics and causality became the foundations of science. The world of religious feeling, of the irrational and of mysticism, which had played so great a part in medieval times, was more and more submerged by the triumphs of logical thought. Similarly, art became more realistic and sensuous. It broke away from the religious subjects of the Middle Ages and embraced the whole visible world. It was overwhelmed by the manifoldness of the earth, by its splendor and horror, and became what Gothic art had been before it, a true symbol of the spirit of the age. Thus it can hardly be regarded as accidental that a change also came over ecclesiastical building. In contrast to the soaring Gothic cathedrals, there were more circular ground plans. The circle replaced the Latin cross. This change in form, however, and this is the important point for the history of symbolism, must be attributed to aesthetic and not to religious causes. That is the only possible explanation for the fact that the center of these round churches, the truly holy place, is empty, and that the altar stands in a recess in a wall away from the center. For that reason, the plan cannot be described as a true mandala. An important exception is St. Peter's in Rome, which was built to the plans of Bramante and Michelangelo. Here the altar stands in the center. One is tempted, however, to attribute this exception to the genius of the architects, for great genius is always both of and beyond its time. In spite of the far-reaching changes in art, philosophy, and science brought about by the Renaissance, the central symbol of Christianity remained unchanged. Christ was still represented on the Latin cross, as he is today. That meant that the center of religious man remained anchored on a higher, more spiritual plane than that of earthly man, who had turned back to nature. Thus a rift arose between man's traditional Christianity and his rational or intellectual mind. Since that time, these two sides of modern man have never been brought together. In the course of the centuries, with man's growing insight into nature and its laws, this division has gradually grown wider, and it still splits the psyche of the Western Christian in the twentieth century. Of course, the brief historical summary given here has been oversimplified. 
Moreover, it omits the secret religious movements within Christianity that took account in their beliefs of what was usually ignored by most Christians, the question of evil, the thonic or earthly spirit. Such movements were always in a minority and seldom had any very visible influence, but in their way they fulfilled the important role of a contrapuntal accompaniment to Christian spirituality. Among the many sects and movements that arose about A.D. 1000, the alchemists played a very important part. They exalted the mysteries of matter and set them alongside those of the heavenly spirit of Christianity. What they sought was a wholeness of man encompassing mind and body, and they invented a thousand names and symbols for it. One of their central symbols was the quadratura circuli, the squaring of the circle, which is no more than the true mandala. The alchemists not only recorded their work in their writings, they created a wealth of pictures of their dreams and visions, symbolic pictures that are still as profound as they are baffling. They were inspired by the dark side of nature, evil, the dream, the spirit of earth. The mode of expression was always fabulous, dreamlike, and unreal in both word and picture. The great 15th century Flemish painter Hieronymus Bosch may be regarded as the most important representative of this kind of imaginative art. But at the same time, more typical Renaissance painters, working in the full light of day, so to speak, were producing the most splendid works of sensuous art. Their fascination with earth and nature went so deep that it practically determined the development of visual art for the next five centuries. The last great representatives of sensuous art, the art of the passing moment, of light and air, were the 19th century Impressionists. We may here discriminate between two radically different modes of artistic representation. Many attempts have been made to define their characteristics. Recently, Herbert Thun, whose work on the cave paintings I have already mentioned, has tried to draw a distinction between what he calls the imaginative and the sensory style. The sensory style generally depicts a direct reproduction of nature or of the picture subject. The imaginative, on the other hand, presents a fantasy or experience of the artist in an unrealistic, even dreamlike, and sometimes abstract manner. Kuhn's two conceptions seem so simple and so clear that I am glad to make use of them. The first beginnings of imaginative art go back very far in history. In the Mediterranean basin, its efflorescence dates from the third millennium B.C., it has only recently been realized that these ancient works of art are not the results of incompetence or ignorance. They are modes of expression of a perfectly definite religious and spiritual emotion. And they have a special appeal today, for during the last half century, art has been passing once more through a phase that can be described by the term imaginative. Today, the geometrical or abstract symbol of the circle has again come to play a considerable role in painting but with few exceptions, the traditional mode of representation has undergone a characteristic transformation that corresponds to the dilemma of modern man's existence. The circle is no longer a single meaningful figure that embraces a whole world and dominates the picture. Sometimes the artist has taken it out of its dominant position, replacing it by a loosely organized group of circles. Sometimes the plane of the circle is asymmetrical. An example of the asymmetrical circular plane may be seen in the famous sun disks of the French painter Robert Delaunay. A painting by the modern English painter Siri Richards, now in Dr. Jung's collection, contains an entirely asymmetrical circular plane, while far to the left there appears a very much smaller and empty circle. In the French painter Henri Matisse's still life with vase of nasturtiums, the focus of vision is a green sphere on a slanting black beam, which seems to gather into itself the manifold circles of the nasturtium leaves. The sphere overlaps a rectangular figure, the top left-hand corner of which is folded over. Given the artistic perfection of the painting, it is easy to forget that in the past these two abstract figures, the circle and the square, would have been united and would have expressed a world of thoughts and feelings. But anyone who does remember and raises the question of meaning will find food for thought. The two figures that from the beginning of time have formed a whole are in this painting torn apart or incoherently related. Yet both are there and are touching each other. In a picture painted by the Russian-born artist Vasily Kandinsky, 
there is a loose assembly of colored balls or circles that seem to be drifting like soap bubbles. They, too, are tenuously connected with a background of one large rectangle with two small, almost square rectangles contained in it. In another picture, which he called a few circles, a dark cloud, or is it a swooping bird, again bears a loosely arranged group of bright balls or circles. Circles often appear in unexpected connections in the mysterious compositions of the British artist Paul Nash. In the primeval solitude of his landscape, Event on the Downs, a ball lies in the right foreground. Though it is apparently a tennis ball, the design on its surface forms the Tai Chi Tu, the Chinese symbol of eternity. Thus it opens up a new dimension in the loneliness of the landscape. Something similar happens in Nash's landscape from a dream. Balls are rolling out of sight in an infinitely wide mirrored landscape with a huge sun visible on the horizon. Another ball lies in the foreground, in front of the roughly square mirror. In his drawing Limits of Understanding, the Swiss artist Paul Klee places the simple figure of a sphere or a circle above a complex structure of ladders and lines. Dr. Jung has pointed out that a true symbol appears only when there is a need to express what thought cannot think or what is only divined or felt. That is the purpose of Clay's simple figure at the limits of understanding. It is important to note that the square, or groups of rectangles and squares, or rectangles and rhomboids, have appeared in modern art just as often as the circle. The master of harmonious, indeed musical, compositions with squares is the Dutch-born artist Piet Mondrian. As a rule, there is no actual center in any of his pictures, yet they form an ordered whole in their own strict, almost ascetic fashion. Still more common are paintings by other artists with irregular quaternary compositions or numerous rectangles combined in more or less loose groups. The circle is a symbol of the psyche. Even Plato described the psyche as a sphere. The square, and often the rectangle, is a symbol of earthbound matter, of the body and reality. In most modern art, the connection between these two primary forms is either non-existent or loose and casual. Their separation is another symbolic expression of the psychic state of twentieth-century man. His soul has lost its roots, and he is threatened by dissociation. Even in the world situation of today, as Dr. Jung pointed out in his opening chapter, this split has become evident. The western and eastern halves of the earth are separated by an iron curtain. But the frequency with which the square and the circle appear must not be overlooked. There seems to be an uninterrupted psychic urge to bring into consciousness the basic factors of life that they symbolize. Also, in certain abstract pictures of our time, which merely represent a colored structure or a kind of primal matter, these forms occasionally appear as if they were germs of new growth. The symbol of the circle has played a curious part in a very different phenomenon of the life of our day, and occasionally still does so. In the last years of the Second World War, there arose the visionary rumor of round flying bodies that became known as flying saucers, or UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Jung has explained the UFOs as a projection of a psychic content of wholeness that has at all times been symbolized by the circle. In other words, this visionary rumor, as can also be seen in many dreams of our time, is an attempt by the unconscious collective psyche to heal the split in our apocalyptic age by means of the symbol of the circle. Modern Painting as a Symbol The terms modern art and modern painting are used in this chapter as the layman uses them. What I will be dealing with, to use Kuhn's term, is modern imaginative painting. Pictures of this kind can be abstract, or rather non-figurative, but they need not always be so. There will be no attempt to distinguish among such various forms as fauvism, cubism, expressionism, futurism, suprematism, constructivism, orphism, and so on. Any specific allusion to one or the other of these groups will be quite exceptional. And I am not concerned with an aesthetic differentiation of modern paintings, nor above all with artistic evaluations. Modern imaginative painting is here taken simply as a phenomenon of our time. 
That is the only way in which the question of its symbolic content can be justified and answered. In this brief chapter, it is possible to mention only a few artists and to select a few of their works more or less at random. I must content myself with discussing modern painting in terms of a small number of its representatives. My starting point is the psychological fact that the artist has at all times been the instrument and spokesman of the spirit of his age. His work can be only partly understood in terms of his personal psychology. Consciously or unconsciously, the artist gives form to the nature and values of his time, which in their turn form him. The modern artist himself often recognizes the interrelation of the work of art and its time. Thus the French critic and painter Jean Bazin writes in his notes on contemporary painting, Nobody paints as he likes. All a painter can do is to will with all his might the painting his age is capable of. The German artist Franz Marc, who died in the First World War, said, The great artists do not seek their forms in the mist of the past, but take the deepest soundings they can of the genuine, profoundest center of gravity of their age. And as far back as 1911, Kandinsky wrote in his famous essay Concerning the Spiritual in Art, Every epoch is given its own measure of artistic freedom, and even the most creative genius may not leap over the boundary of that freedom. For the last fifty years, modern art has been a general bone of contention, and the discussion has lost none of its heat. The yeas are as passionate as the nays, yet the reiterated prophecy that modern art is finished has never come true. The new way of expression has been triumphant to an unimagined degree. If it is threatened at all, it will be because it has degenerated into mannerism and modishness. In the Soviet Union, where non-figurative art has often been officially discouraged and produced only in private, figurative art is threatened by a similar degeneration. The general public, in Europe at any rate, is still in the heat of the battle. The violence of the discussion shows that feeling runs high in both camps, even those who are hostile to modern art cannot avoid being impressed by the works they reject. They are irritated or repelled, but, as the violence of their feelings shows, they are moved. As a rule, the negative fascination is no less strong than the positive. The stream of visitors to exhibitions of modern art, wherever and whenever they take place, testifies to something more than curiosity. Curiosity would be satisfied sooner and the fantastic prices that are paid for works of modern art are a measure of the status conferred upon them by society. Fascination arises when the unconscious has been moved. The effect produced by works of modern art cannot be explained entirely by their visible form. To the eye trained in classic or sensory art, they are new and alien. Nothing in works of non-figurative art reminds the spectator of his own world, no objects in their own everyday surroundings, no human being or animal that speaks a familiar language. There is no welcome, no visible accord in the cosmos created by the artist. And yet, without any question, there is a human bond. It may be even more intense than in works of sensory art, which make a direct appeal to feeling and empathy. It is the aim of the modern artist to give expression to his inner vision of man, to the spiritual background of life and the world. The modern work of art has abandoned not only the realm of the concrete, natural, sensuous world, but also that of the individual. It has become highly collective, and therefore, even in the abbreviation of the pictorial hieroglyph, touches not only the few, but the many. What remains individual is the manner of representation, the style and quality of the modern work of art. It is often difficult for the layman to recognize whether the artist's intentions are genuine and his expression spontaneous, neither imitated nor aimed at effect. In many cases he must accustom himself to new kinds of line and color. He must learn them as he would learn a foreign language before he can judge their expressiveness and quality. The pioneers of modern art have apparently understood how much they were asking of the public. Never have artists published so many manifestos and explanations of their aims as in the twentieth century. It is, however, not only to others that they are striving to explain and justify what they are doing, it is also to themselves. For the most part, these manifestos are artistic confessions of faith, 
poetic and often confused or self-contradictory attempts to give clarity to the strange outcome of today's artistic activities. What really matters, of course, is and always has been the direct encounter with the work of art. Yet for the psychologist who is concerned with the symbolic content of modern art, the study of these writings is most instructive. For that reason, the artists, wherever possible, will be allowed in the following discussion to speak for themselves. The beginnings of modern art appeared in the early 1900s. One of the most impressive personalities of that initiatory phase was Kandinsky, whose influence is still clearly traceable in the paintings of the second half of the century. Many of his ideas have proved prophetic. In his essay Concerning Form, he writes, The art of today embodies the spiritual matured to the point of revelation. The forms of this embodiment may be arranged between two poles. One, great abstraction. Two, great realism. These two poles open two paths, which both lead to one goal in the end. These two elements have always been present in art. The first was expressed in the second. Today it looks as if they were about to carry on separate existences. Art seems to have put an end to the pleasant completion of the abstract by the concrete, and vice versa. To illustrate Kandinsky's point that the two elements of art, the abstract and the concrete, have parted company, in 1913 the Russian painter Kazimir Malevich painted a picture that consisted only of a black square on a white ground. It was perhaps the first purely abstract picture ever painted. He wrote of it, In my desperate struggle to liberate art from the ballast of the world of objects, I took refuge in the form of the square. A year later, the French painter Marcel Duchamp set up an object chosen at random, a bottle rack, on a pedestal and exhibited it. Jean Bazin wrote of it, This bottle rack, torn from its utilitarian context and washed up on the beach, has been invested with the lonely dignity of the derelict. Good for nothing, there to be used, ready for anything, it is alive. It lives on the fringe of existence its own disturbing, absurd life. The disturbing object, that is the first step to art. In its weird dignity and abandonment, the object was immeasurably exalted and given significance that can only be called magical, hence its disturbing, absurd life. It became an idol and at the same time an object of mockery. Its intrinsic reality was annihilated. Both Malevich's square and Duchamp's bottle rack were symbolic gestures that had nothing to do with art in the strict sense of the word, yet they marked the two extremes great abstraction, and great realism, between which the imaginative art of the succeeding decades may be aligned and understood. From the psychological standpoint, the two gestures toward the naked object, matter, and the naked non-object, spirit, point to a collective psychic rift that created its symbolic expression in the years before the catastrophe of the First World War. This rift had first appeared in the Renaissance, when it became manifest as a conflict between knowledge and faith. Meanwhile, civilization was removing man further and further from his instinctual foundation, so that a gulf opened between nature and mind, between the unconscious and consciousness. These opposites characterize the psychic situation that is seeking expression in modern art. The Secret Soul of Things as we have seen, the starting point of the concrete was Duchamp's famous or notorious bottle rack. The bottle rack was not intended to be artistic in itself. Duchamp called himself an anti-artist, but it brought to light an element that was to mean a great deal to artists for a long time to come. The name they gave to it was Objet Trouvé, or Ready Made. The Spanish painter, Juan Miró, for instance, goes to the beach every dawn to collect things washed up by the tide, things lying there, waiting for someone to discover their personality. He keeps his finds in his studio. Now and then he assembles some of them, and the most curious compositions result. The artist is often surprised himself at the shapes of his own creation. As far back as 1912, the Spanish-born artist Pablo Picasso and the French artist Georges Braque made what they called collages from scraps of rubbish. Max Ernst cut clippings from the illustrated papers of the so-called Age of Big Business, 
assembled them as the fancy took him, and so transformed the stuffy solidity of the bourgeois age into a demonic, dreamlike unreality. The German painter Kurt Schwitters worked with the contents of his ash can. He used nails, brown paper, ragged scraps of newspaper, railway tickets, and remnants of cloth. He succeeded in assembling this rubbish with such seriousness and freshness that surprising effects of strange beauty came about. In Fitter's obsession with things, however, this manner of composition occasionally became merely absurd. He made a construction of rubbish that he called a cathedral built for things. Schwitters worked on it for ten years, and three stories of his own house had to be demolished to give him the space he needed. Schwitters' work and the magical exaltation of the object give the first hint of the place of modern art in the history of the human mind and of its symbolic significance. They reveal the tradition that was being unconsciously perpetuated. It is the tradition of the hermetic Christian brotherhoods of the Middle Ages and of the alchemists who conferred even on matter, the stuff of the earth, the dignity of their religious contemplation. Schwitter's exaltation of the grossest material to the rank of art to a cathedral in which the rubbish would leave no room for a human being, faithfully followed the old alchemical tenet according to which the sought-for precious object is to be found in filth. Kandinsky expressed the same ideas when he wrote, Everything that is dead quivers, not only the things of poetry, stars, moon, wood, flowers, but even a white trouser button glittering out of a puddle in the street. Everything has a secret soul, which is silent more often than it speaks. What the artists, like the alchemists, probably did not realize was the psychological fact that they were projecting part of their psyche into matter or inanimate objects, hence the mysterious animation that entered into such things and the great value attached even to rubbish. They projected their own darkness, their earthly shadow, a psychic content that they and their time had lost and abandoned. Unlike the alchemists, however, men like Schwitters were not contained in and protected by the Christian order. In one sense, Schwitters' work is opposed to it. A kind of monomania binds him to matter while Christianity seeks to vanquish matter. And yet, paradoxically, it is Schwitters' monomania that robs the material in his creations of its inherent significance as concrete reality. In his pictures, matter is transformed into an abstract composition, Therefore, it begins to discard its substantiality and to dissolve. In that very process, these pictures become a symbolic expression of our time, which has seen the concept of the absolute concreteness of matter undermined by modern atomic physics. Painters began to think about the magic object and the secret soul of things. The Italian painter Carlo Carà wrote, It is the common things that reveal those forms of simplicity through which we can realize that higher, more significant condition of being where the whole splendor of art resides. Paul Clay said, The object expands beyond the bounds of its appearance by our knowledge that the thing is more than its exterior presents to our eyes. And Jean Bazin wrote, An object awakens our love just because it seems to be the bearer of powers that are greater than itself. Sayings of this kind recall the old alchemical concept of a spirit in matter, believed to be the spirit in and behind inanimate objects like metal or stone. Psychologically interpreted, this spirit is the unconscious. It always manifests itself when conscious or rational knowledge has reached its limits and mystery sets in. For man tends to fill the inexplicable and mysterious with the contents of his unconscious. He projects them, as it were, into a dark, empty vessel. The feeling that the object was more than met the eye, which was shared by many artists, found a most remarkable expression in the work of the Italian painter Giorgio de Chirico. He was a mystic by temperament and a tragic seeker who never found what he sought. On his self-portrait, 1908, he wrote, Et quid amabo nisi quod enigma est. And what am I to love if not the enigma? Chirico was the founder of the so-called Pittura Metaphysica. Every object, he wrote, has two aspects. The common aspect, which is the one we generally see and which is seen by everyone, and the ghostly and metaphysical aspect, which only rare individuals see at moments of clairvoyance and metaphysical meditation. A work of art 
must relate something that does not appear in its visible form. Kiriko's works reveal this ghostly aspect of things. They are dreamlike transpositions of reality which arise as visions from the unconscious. But his metaphysical abstraction is expressed in a panic-stricken rigidity, and the atmosphere of the pictures is one of nightmare and of fathomless melancholy. The city squares of Italy, the towers and objects, are set in an over-acute perspective as if they were in a vacuum, illuminated by a merciless cold light from an unseen source. Antique heads or statues of gods conjure up the classical past. In one of the most terrifying of his pictures, he has placed beside the marble head of a goddess a pair of red rubber gloves, a magic object in the modern sense. A green ball on the ground acts as a symbol, uniting the crass opposites. Without it, there would be more than a hint of psychic disintegration. This picture was clearly not the result of over-sophisticated deliberation. It must be taken as a dream picture. Kiriko was deeply influenced by the philosophies of Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. He wrote, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche were the first to teach the deep significance of the senselessness of life and to show how this senselessness could be transformed into art. The dreadful void, they discovered, is the very soulless and untroubled beauty of matter. It may be doubted whether Kiriko succeeded in transposing the dreadful void into untroubled beauty. Some of his pictures are extremely disturbing. Many are as terrifying as nightmares. But in his effort to find artistic expression for the void, he penetrated to the core of the existential dilemma of contemporary man. Nietzsche, whom Kiriko quotes as his authority, has given a name to the dreadful void in his saying, God is dead. Without referring to Nietzsche, Kandinsky wrote in On the Spiritual in Art, Heaven is empty, God is dead. A phrase of this kind may sound abominable, but it is not new. The idea of the death of God and its immediate consequence, the metaphysical void, had troubled the minds of 19th century poets, especially in France and Germany. It was a long development that in the 20th century reached the stage of open discussion and found expression in art. The cleavage between modern art and Christianity was finally accomplished. Dr. Jung also came to realize that this strange and mysterious phenomenon of the death of God is a psychic fact of our time. In 1937 he wrote, I know, and here I am expressing what countless other people know, that the present time is the time of God's disappearance and death. For years he had observed the Christian God image fading in his patient's dreams, that is, in the unconscious of modern men. The loss of that image is the loss of the supreme factor that gives life a meaning. It must be pointed out, however, that neither Nietzsche's assertion that God is dead, nor Kiriko's metaphysical void, nor Jung's deductions from unconscious images have anything final to say about the reality and existence of God or of a transcendental being or not being. They are human assertions. In each case, they are based, as Jung has shown in psychology and religion, on contents of the unconscious psyche that have entered consciousness in tangible form as images, dreams, ideas, or intuitions. The origin of these contents and the cause of such a transformation, from a living to a dead god, must remain unknown on the frontier of mystery. Kiriko never came to a solution of the problem presented to him by the unconscious. His failure may be seen most clearly in his representation of the human figure, Given the present religious situation, it is man himself to whom should be accorded a new, if impersonal, dignity and responsibility. Jung described it as a responsibility to consciousness. But in Kiriko's work, man is deprived of his soul. He becomes a manichino, a puppet without a face, and therefore also without consciousness. In the various versions of his great metaphysician, a faceless figure is enthroned on a pedestal made of rubbish. The figure is a consciously or unconsciously ironical representation of the man who strives to discover the truth about metaphysics and at the same time a symbol of ultimate loneliness and senselessness. Or perhaps the manichini, which also haunt the works of other contemporary artists, are a premonition of the faceless mass man. When he was forty, Kiriko abandoned his pittura metaphysica, he turned back to traditional modes 
but his work lost depth. Here is certain proof that there is no back to where you came from for the creative mind whose unconscious has been involved in the fundamental dilemma of modern existence. A counterpart to Kiriko might be seen in the Russian-born painter Marc Chagall. His quest in his work is also a mysterious and lonely poetry and the ghostly aspect of things that only rare individuals may see. But Chagall's rich symbolism is rooted in the piety of Eastern Jewish Hasidism and in a warm feeling for life. He was faced with neither the problem of the void nor the death of God. He wrote, Everything may change in our demoralized world except the heart, man's love, and his striving to know the divine. Painting, like all poetry, has its part in the divine. People feel this today just as much as they used to. The British author, Sir Herbert Reed, once wrote of Chagall, that he never quite crossed the threshold into the unconscious, but has always kept one foot on the earth that had nourished him. This is exactly the right relation to the unconscious. It is all the more important that, as Reed emphasizes, Chagall has remained one of the most influential artists of our time. With the contrast between Chagall and Kiriko, a question arises that is important for the understanding of symbolism in modern art. How does the relationship between consciousness and the unconscious take shape in the work of modern artists? Or, to put it another way, where does man stand? One answer may be found in the movement called Surrealism, of which the French poet André Breton is regarded as the founder. Kiriko, too, may be described as a Surrealist. As a student of medicine, Breton had been introduced to the work of Freud. Thus dreams came to play an important part in his ideas. Can dreams not be used to solve the fundamental problems of life, he wrote? I believe that the apparent antagonism between dream and reality will be resolved in a kind of absolute reality, in surreality. Breton grasped the point admirably. What he sought was a reconciliation of the opposites, consciousness and the unconscious. But the way he took to reach his goal could only lead him astray. He began to experiment with Freud's method of free association, as well as with automatic writing, in which the words and phrases arising from the unconscious are set down without any conscious control. Breton called it thought's dictation, independent of any aesthetic or moral preoccupation. But that process simply means that the way is open to the stream of unconscious images, and the important or even decisive part to be played by consciousness is ignored. As Dr. Jung has shown in his chapter, it is consciousness that holds the key to the values of the unconscious and that therefore plays the decisive part. Consciousness alone is competent to determine the meaning of the images and to recognize their significance for man here and now in the concrete reality of the present. Only in an interplay of consciousness and the unconscious can the unconscious prove its value and perhaps even show a way to overcome the melancholy of the void. If the unconscious once in action is left to itself, there is a risk that its contents will become overpowering or will manifest their negative, destructive side. If we look at surrealist pictures like Salvador Dali's The Burning Giraffe with this in mind, we may feel the wealth of their fantasy and the overwhelming power of their unconscious imagery, but we realize the horror and the symbolism of the end of all things that speaks for many of them. The unconscious is pure nature, and, like nature, pours out its gifts in profusion. But left to itself, and without the human response from consciousness, it can, again like nature, destroy its own gifts, and sooner or later sweep them into annihilation. The question of the role of consciousness in modern painting also arises in connection with the use of chance as a means of composing paintings. In Beyond Painting, Max Ernst wrote, The association of a sewing machine and an umbrella on a surgical table, he is quoting from the poet Le Tréamont, is a familiar example, which has now become classical, of the phenomenon discovered by the Surrealists, that the association of two or more apparently alien objects on a plane alien to both is the most potent ignition of poetry. That is probably as difficult for the layman to comprehend as the comment Breton made to the same effect, The man who cannot visualize a horse galloping on a tomato is an idiot. We might recall here the chance association of a marble head and red rubber gloves in Kiriko's picture. 
Of course, many of these associations were intended as jokes and nonsense. But most modern artists have been concerned with something radically different from jokes. Chance plays a significant part in the work of the French sculptor Jean or Hans Arp. His woodcuts of leaves and other forms, thrown together at random, were another expression of the quest for, as he put it, a secret primal meaning slumbering beneath the world of appearances. He called them leaves arranged according to the laws of chance and squares arranged according to the laws of chance. In these compositions, it is chance that gives depth to the work of art. It points to an unknown but active principle of order and meaning that becomes manifest in things as their secret soul. It was above all the desire to make chance essential, in Paul Clay's words, that underlay the Surrealists' efforts to take the grain of wood, cloud formations, and so on, as a starting point for their visionary painting. Max Ernst, for instance, went back to Leonardo da Vinci, who wrote an essay on Botticelli's remark that if you throw a paint-soaked sponge at a wall, in the splashes it makes you will see heads, animals, landscapes, and a host of other configurations. Ernst has described how a vision pursued him in 1925. It forced itself on him as he was staring at a tiled floor marked by thousands of scratches. In order to give foundation to my powers of meditation and hallucination, I made a series of drawings of the tiles by laying sheets of paper on them at random and then taking graphite rubbings. When I fixed my eyes on the result, I was astounded by a suddenly sharpened sense of a hallucinatory series of contrasting and superposed pictures. I made a collection of the first results obtained from these frottages and called it Histoire Naturelle. It is important to note that Ernst placed over or behind some of these frottages a ring or circle which gives the picture a peculiar atmosphere and depth. Here the psychologist can recognize the unconscious drive to oppose the chaotic hazards of the image's natural language by the symbol of a self-contained psychic whole, thus establishing equilibrium. The ring or circle dominates the picture. Psychic wholeness rules nature, itself meaningful and giving meaning. In Max Ernst's efforts to pursue the secret pattern in things, we may detect an affinity with the 19th century romantics. They spoke of nature's handwriting, which can be seen everywhere, on wings, eggshells, in clouds, snow, ice crystals, and other strange conjunctions of chance, just as much as in dreams or visions. They saw everything as the expression of one and the same pictorial language of nature. Thus it was a genuinely romantic gesture when Max Ernst called the pictures produced by his experiments natural history. And he was right for the unconscious which had conjured up the pictures in the chance configuration of things is nature. It is with Ernst's natural history or Arp's compositions of chance that the reflections of the psychologist begin. He is faced with the question of what meaning a chance arrangement, wherever and whenever it comes about, can have for the man who happens on it.